Good morning. The title of my talk is Fixing Healthcare in America, and the objective of the talk, since every session at IHI has an objective, is developing a strategic approach to multiple levels of health care reform in America. The real working title of the talk, the one that I carried around as I was thinking about it, is Facts, Thoughts, Truths, Strategic Opportunities, Magical Thinking, Urban Legends, and Functional Health Care Reform, Stage 2. Uh, first, before I deal with those topics, let me comment for a second on this week. It has been a lovely week at IHI. Uh, the work, the sessions have been incredible, they've been magnificent, they've been wonderful, they've been extremely useful, and it has been four days of learning. This quality conference has been exceptional, and I'd like to say well done, Maureen and team. You've done a, you've done a great job here. Uh, And why are these four days so important? Because we, as a country, need to become a learning culture for care. We are not a learning culture in the very best and, and most optimal sense of being a learning culture. And we need to get there. And this is a time and a place and a process of learning at IHI. Um, one of the things that people who work with me hear me say a lot is each thing in its turn, each thing in its time. And as we're trying to get things done on any given area of our world, getting things done in the right sequence at the right time is extremely important. So each thing in its turn, each thing in its time. And healthcare reform is an idea whose time has come. It is the turn for healthcare reform. It is the time for health care reform, and we need to achieve health care reform in America. We're starting with a health care industry that is massive. Health care as a business generates $2.7 trillion in revenue. It is the fastest growing segment of a troubled economy. If the auto industry had numbers that looked anything like health care, it would be considered the most successful industry on the planet. By itself, American health care is larger than the total economies of all but five countries, including the U.S. Only China, Japan, India, and Germany have total economies that are larger than U.S. health care all by itself. So it's a massive and internally successful industry. And the problem is, is that we cannot afford the cost burden that health care imposes on the rest of the economy. We can't afford the cost burden on the government. We can't afford the cost burden on industry. And so even though as an industry it's extremely successful internally, the impact on the economy requires us to reform health care. So when we reform health care, doing that's not doing just one thing. There's basically four key components to health care reform, and we need to do all four. And the four components are coverage, care, cost, and health. And I'm going to talk about all four. We need to discuss and understand and accomplish all four of those components, and we need to achieve all four of them in order to make health care affordable and to make it the kind of asset for America that health care ought to be. Those agendas, coverage, care, cost, and health, work best as a package, and they each need to be their own agenda. We need to achieve each of them with strategic thinking and commitment as, an, as a country. And as a package, we need to cover everyone. We need to make care better for everyone. We need to make care affordable for everyone. And we need to have our people in this country have better health. So coverage, care, cost, and health. Now, before I talk about that, I'm going to say a few words about Kaiser Permanente to give you a sense of the perspective that I come from and the experience that we've been having as we've been going down this trail. So, I'll talk a little bit about KP and talk about why the KP learning process and the KP learning journey 
and the implementation of some of the systems and tools at KP are relevant to overall health care reform for America. People who don't know us um, don't know that we have two things that make us different from just about everyone else in health care, and those two key facts are vertical integration and prepayment. We're a vertically integrated system, uh, total care delivery plus financing, and we are overwhelmingly get our revenue from prepayment. And those two facts give us the platform to think like an entire healthcare economy. And so the learnings that we have become applicable to total healthcare economies. And we're very different than the rest of much of the rest of American healthcare because in a world of economically, operationally, functionally splintered and functionally suboptimalizing delivery business units, we're blessed with the ability to be a total package rather than a bunch of pieces. And when you look at the package, we have hospitals, we have physicians, we have labs, we have pharmacies, imaging centers, we have all of the pieces. And we basically play every position in the game. So we think of it as being a total package of care delivery. We have 160,000 employees, we have 15,000 physicians, the largest private medical groups in the world. We have 490 care sites that we own and operate. We have 100,000 workers in unit-based teams through our labor management partnership. We actually at the front line throughout Kaiser Permanente have unit-based teams at just about every front line site. And the unit-based teams work together as teams focusing on improving the care delivery, the service, and the quality. And the unit-based teams are centered on this value compass. This value compass is extremely important to us, and it's not just important to us at the governance level or the management level. This is the value compass that exists at the front level for each of these unit-based teams. And if you look at the value compass, you'll see it's about best quality, most affordable, best place to work, best service, and the center of the value compass, the heart of the value compass, is the member and the patient. So we have unit-based teams, 100,000 people at the front level sitting down and looking at their workflows, their work processes, what they do every day with this value compass as the center of those discussions. And that's a very effective uh, process. And we do it to scale. We have 8.5 million patients in our care system. We have $42 billion in revenue. Uh, and that makes us as a care system bigger than 42 states and 135 countries so that we can do things to scale. When we figure out that something ought to be done, one of the really nice things about being at Kaiser Permanente is we have enough cash flow that we can invest in doing those things. And so we can do experiments, we can do pilots. We have one hospital right now where we are experimenting with um, handheld iPad-like connectivity devices that are going from bed to bed with the nurse with the goal of eliminating um, the PC um, in, in the hospitals. We, we can do that kind of experimentation because we're big enough so that the IT companies are happy to come in and work with us and because we've got caregivers who want to figure these things out and figure out optimal connectivity. So we can do things to scale, we can afford to invest what we do, we can put real money into both our care sites and our systems. And the reason that we can make those investments and the way we can make them is that we're prepaid. Prepaid is absolutely magical because prepaid gives us a cash flow. We have an accountability on the one end and a cash flow on the other, and we can figure out how to use the cash flow to achieve the accountability. We're not a fee-for-service organization. <clears throat> I have worked, functioned, lived, managed fee-for-service organizations, and it is different. I like this model better. We don't have to live and survive financially by billing for pieces of care. We get to sell a package of care. I was talking yesterday here to a good friend of mine who's a psychiatrist who was talking about um, working with some pediatricians who have kids who are diabetic or having trouble accepting their diabetes and, and being in compliance 
and they want to work together as a team to do good things to help those kids and they can't figure out how to do it because they work for different business units, they have different billing functions, they don't know what codes to use for the billing and so even though there's this really wonderful thing they want to do together, they are prevented from doing it by the tyranny of the fee-for-service billing system. And we don't have to do that. We can figure those things out and then we get to do them. So we get to be patient-focused rather than subjected to the functional tyranny of fees. And that is relevant to the country, not because everybody else can get to that model, but because we can then think about what ought to be done for the patient, what are the right things that patient care should look like, what should the flow of data look like, and we can do that independently of those strictures and structures that are totally built around the flow of fees. It's a very nice world. And as a result of that, we can do things like focus on patients with broken bones and do proactive programs to identify people at high risk of broken bones and make sure that the entire care team functions in a positive way to make sure that each of those patients gets what they need to prevent the broken bones. We cut the number of broken bones in one year by 42 percent. That saved us $47 million in hospital admissions and for us as a prepaid plan that was great. For anybody else that would have been lost billing for the hospital, lost billing for the orthopods and for us it was because it was prepaid uh, we were able to do that and not have the, the lost revenue. So we've expanded it and now we're saving $100 million with that program. For any fee dependent system that would have been $100 million in lost revenue. So because of that we can make investments. We, can, we made a $4 billion investment in our EMR as I mentioned earlier and we could do that based on its ability to support care and its ability to connect caregivers and ability to connect patients and we didn't need to worry about the opportunities to bill for each piece of that. So our vision was to have a paperless system. We don't want any paper inside Kaiser Permanente. We want all the pieces connected electronically in real time. We want our clinics to be paperless, our hospitals paperless, and we want patient connectivity to be set up paperless. And we're kind of on the cutting edge of some patient connectivity. Uh, Kaiser Permanente uh, won 24 Stage 7 HIMSS awards last year. Um, stage 7 means the most wireless, paper-free hospitals. 36 hospitals in America won that award and we were 24 of them. This next year we expect to be about 36 of them. Um, that, that number is, is going up. Um, this last week, uh, Maureen mentioned this at the beginning of the conference, uh, the LeapFrog Group passed out their hospitals of excellent awards. They passed out 53 in the country, 16 of them were us, and the reason 16 of them were us was because of what we're doing with computer support in our hospitals. So our level of computerization is extremely important to us. And for the patients, we're connecting the patients electronically. Every one of our patients can get their medical record. They also can do e-visits with their physicians and the secure messaging. And we did 12 million e-visits last year. We think we did well over half the e-visits done in the world were done at Kaiser Permanente. And in the fee-for-service world, each of those was a potential fee in a bill anywhere from 80 bucks to $200 that we couldn't collect but didn't need to collect because we're prepaid. So anybody who lives on fees, that would have been over a billion dollars in lost revenue. So, and the patients love e-visits and they love e-connectivity. And e-visits create productivity gain in our office. So. Because we are prepaid, because we're vertically integrated, because we have the, the commitment we have, uh, we now have 10 million electronic medical records and the learning for the country is when you get all of the data on the computer and the computer is available to the doctors real time and the doctors know what every other doctor's done for the patient, and when you can embed in that process reminders to do things care actually does get better. This isn't just hypothetical or theoretical. Uh, people keep saying, uh, if you put an EMR in place and it's not connected to any process improvement and it's not set up to be a connectivity tool for teams of caregivers and it's not set up to improve care, it just sits there and does nothing. Electronic silos are just as inefficient as paper silos. People who simply 
put data on in the computer and then expect care somehow to get better, th this room, I and mean, this is a room of experts, everybody here knows this, and so I'm totally preaching to the choir, so I apologize for that. But just putting the data on the computer doesn't make care better. What makes care better is putting the data on the computer and then deciding to cut the number of asthma attacks or cut the number of broken bones or cut the number of people who have heart attacks and then using that data in a meaningful way to achieve that goal. It needs to be a tool, not an end in itself. And so the result of doing it right is better care, faster care, much better data about care. And I'm just going to spend a minute on the data and then I'm going to go back to the major topic of healthcare reform. The EMR creates some incredible learning tools and it is wonderful for research. Most medical research, as the people in this room know, is done with very small samples for very short time frames. So you study a couple hundred patients for a couple of years, finish the study, end the study, the study's over, and you really don't know what happened to those patients two years later, four years later, <clears throat> unless you go back and do another study and it's hard to get that funded and the logistics are really difficult. So most medical research is, is cut into very thin little time-limited slices. And what we can do is longitudinal data. We're taking 30 years of data and putting it into our computer and then looking in real time across entire populations. And we're learning things like um, Alzheimer's research. We went back and looked at, at uh, people who've been with us for 30 years and we discovered that if you had very high cholesterol in your 30s, you had a 260% higher Alzheimer's rate in your 70s. We discovered that if you had hypoglycemic attacks, pre-60s, one attack increased Alzheimer's by 80%, two attacks, 160%, it actually, the math kept going for, for future Alzheimer's. Heavy smokers in midlife, 157% increased risk. And this is the kind of longitudinal data that we can do by going back and looking at the data we have on those patients and then looking at today, today's world. And so the longitudinal research is lovely. And then in the moment, in today's world, looking at what's actually happening in care, uh, we, we were able to do some really fun things. One of the um, question or one of the things that we have available is the data on the entire family because we are a total system and we're not a bunch of pediatricians who are isolated from a bunch of family practitioners or internists. We have the full data. So we had a question that was raised at, at Kaiser Permanente and the question was when pregnant women have an amniotic fluid infection, are their children more likely to have asthma? There were some people who for various observational reasons thought that might be true. So we did that research. Now for us to do that research, because we're one care team, we needed data from the OBs and the pediatricians, and we needed data that went over years, and we could do all of that because of who we are and because of the medical record. And then we also run a lot of our data. Uh, we, we keep track of our data by race and ethnicity as well, so that we can track the data by race and ethnicity. So what did we learn about that connection? Uh, we actually learned that that connection did exist between that particular infection. And for African American kids, there was a 98% higher rate of childhood asthma. For Hispanic kids, there was a 70% higher rate of childhood asthma. For Caucasian kids, there was a 60% higher rate of childhood asthma. And then we looked at Asian American kids and expected to, to see another progression. So what, what did we learn with Asian American kids? And hmm, it's Florida. Um, <clears throat> what did we learn about Asian American kids? Zero. 90% increase for African American kids, zero increase for Asian American kids. Why? We don't know. Uh, it, it must be in some way genetic uh, because one of the things that's true about us, um, we do know that zero and 90 are very different numbers, uh, but we don't know um, exactly why that's true. And, and one of the things that's fascinating about our research is that when you look at us as a research base, we have the same doctors for every patient, we have the same clinics for every patient, we have the same hospitals, we have the same formulary, we have the same drugs, we have the same nurses, we have the same care team, so only one variable changes, which makes it almost perfect 
research environment to deal with issues where one variable changes. Because most settings, you don't, you always wonder, well, was that clinic in a different neighborhood or in a different setting? With us, it's, it's one set of data and one variable is different. So we're going to DNA uh, research is our next step and we're in the process of collecting 500,000 DNA samples. We're putting them on file. We're going to be able to take the DNA database and work back against our electronic medical record database and our researchers are going to be able to do some really important research that I believe is going to save a lot of lives. I think it's going to be very educational. I think lives will be saved and lives will be saved in our setting because we're vertically integrated. We get to actually use the data in a practical way as caregivers. I think we're on the cusp overall of a research golden age, not just at Kaiser Permanente, but everywhere where there are electronic medical records and the medical records are connected with each other as data. There's a golden age of research right in front of us and that's very, very exciting. So we have been a real world learning opportunity for healthcare reform because we've been pioneering the computer support of care and trying to figure out what should it look like, how should it function, what can it do, and we're able to encourage everyone else to go down this path because it's not a dry well. Some of the first attempts to go down into electronic medical records were isolated experiments and pilots that failed because the data was isolated, it wasn't used as part of an overall agenda, and it just sat there on the computer as separate data. And in some cases, it was even harder to get the data into the computer that way, and so it slowed care down instead of making care better.